Hi everyone, my name is Amit Jain. I'm a pediatric and adult spine surgeon at Johns Hopkins, and the chief of minimally invasive spine surgery, and we'll be talking about adolescent idiopathic scoliosis. I have no relevant financial disclosures for this talk. This talk is geared toward primarily a pediatric audience for pediatricians and pediatric care providers who might be seeing these patients and might have questions about how to deal with scoliosis and when to refer. So we have a case of a 13-year-old girl who presented to her pediatrician for an annual well child visit. She was referred to pediatric orthopedics for concern of spinal deformity. There was no significant back pain for her mom. She had a growth spurt last year. So that's important to know when the growth spurt happened whenever you're evaluating a patient with scoliosis. She started her menses about a year prior to presentation. Another very important part of the history because that really gives you a sense of how much growth is remaining. On exam, she had five out of five strength and normal reflexes. Reflexes are a very important part of the spine exam. For every patient who presents with scoliosis, I like to, as part of the full reflex exam, also examine their abdominal reflexes, which give you clues about if there's any spinal cord deformities or spinal cord issues. On exam, she, her right shoulder was higher than her left. Of patients with scoliosis frequently present with shoulder imbalance. And then she had significant rotation, defined by 15 degrees on the scoliometer on forward bend. And we'll kind of go over what that means and what the implications of rotation are. So as part of our examination, we also obtained radiographs. So every patient with scoliosis, or suspected of scoliosis, should have a PA, and a PA as well as a lateral radiograph that should be obtained. And these are her radiographs. So this is the PA radiograph and this is the lateral. And then as you can see, first noticing on the PA, there is an obvious big deformity over here, as well as there are two smaller curves up in, uh, in the upper thoracic and the lumbar region. So it's really important to not get, not get focused on the main curve, but also realize that there are additional either compensatory curves or additional curves that exist along with the main curve. So in this particular situation, the main thoracic curve was about 75 degrees to the right, which is fairly common with AIS. Lumbar curve of 38 degrees to the left, and then there was a upper thoracic curve, which was 40 degrees to the left. The other salient feature here to notice is that this is her lateral radiograph, and on the lumbar spine, she has nice lordosis. But in the thoracic spine, where there should be a normal kyphosis, instead of that, her thoracic spine is actually lordotic. So this is an interesting feature because this feature is unique to scoliosis, where a lot of scoliosis patients, in addition to having a lateral deformity, also have thoracic lordosis, and we'll talk more about this in a minute. So recommendations when we see this patient. So what do we recommend? Do we say, well, no need for follow-up, no need for interventions, follow-up in one year, recommend bracing, or recommend surgery? So what's the evidence and how do, we, how do we go about thinking about this? Well, before we kind of dive deep into what the recommendation should be, let's just take a second and talk about what is scoliosis. So scoliosis is lateral curvature of the spine on a PA radiograph. And this is something what most people understand scoliosis to be. So it's defined as more than 10 degrees. A large portion of the population has less than a 10 degree spinal asymmetry, but unless it's really above 10 degrees, it doesn't really count as scoliosis. Most common curve is actually a right thoracic curve. However, that is not necessary that every curve be that. Some curves can be thoracic, some curves can be lumbar, they can also be left-sided curves, even though the right are much more common. And in reality, while it appears to be primarily a coronal plane issue, a lateral bend issue, scoliosis is actually a 3D deformity. And that's something that's really important to understand in order to both evaluate scoliosis as well as come up with treatment recommendations. So scoliosis is a three-dimensional deformity. In the coronal plane, there's a lateral deformity, which is kind of the most common thing that people observe. In the sagittal plane, it's actually the loss of kyphosis, and that's something we talked about. So the thoracic spine is actually lordotic as opposed to kyphotic, what it naturally should be. And then in the axial plane, there's a lot of rotation. So on this diagram, you can notice that the different vertebral bodies are rotated with respect to each other differentially. 
and that rotation is actually what leads to asymmetry of the ribs, leads to asymmetry of the scapula, and leads to kind of the prominent features that are noticeable by the families. So how does scoliosis present? Well, in terms of scoliosis signs, we frequently see that the head is off-center, the shoulders are uneven, as you can see here in this particular situation, the right shoulder is higher than the left, as was the case in our case presentation. There's a significant shift of the ribs, the rib cage is shifted and translated, there's an asymmetry of the waist, and then there's a lot of pelvic imbalance, which has implications for low back pain, implications for hip pain, etc. What about scoliosis detection? So scoliosis is often picked up either at school screening or at the pediatrician's office, as was the case in our child, with a forward bend test. And forward bend test is actually fairly straightforward. So we have the child and you ask them to bend forward and try to touch their toes. And this is what a normal spine looks like. You know, they're the balance, it's nicely balanced, there's not a lot of rotation. This is what a scoliotic spine looks like. In this particular case, there's a right thoracic curve which pushes the rib cage higher on the right side than the left side. A scoliometer may be used. Now this is a device that's available at many uh, pediatricians' offices, but sometimes even if you don't have it to do a rigorous measurement, you can still get an assessment of it based on the forward bend. And the rule of thumb is that seven degrees in the scoliometer corresponds to a 20 degree scoliosis. But that number can change a little bit depending on the patient's uh, body habitus. So. so what causes scoliosis? It's most commonly idiopathic, which means we don't really know what causes it. It's some combination of genetics and developmental processes. It usually presents around the adolescent age, but sometimes can present earlier. Sometimes it's juvenile or even, even babies can have it, infantile scoliosis. And even though idiopathic is the most common kind, there are other kinds as well. There may be congenital scoliosis, which can be because of failure of normal vertebral development either failure of segmentation or failure of formation of the vertebral bodies, or neuromuscular scoliosis, which is curvature due to disorders of the brain, the spinal cord, and muscular system. For example, a kid with cerebral palsy, a child with neuromuscular dystrophy, et cetera. Various kinds of uh, neuromuscular issues can lead to curvature of the spine. So it's really important to distinguish between the two, and our physical examination, especially the reflexes, as well as taking a good history, can help you determine whether you fall into the idiopathic category or other types of scoliosis categories. So what's the natural history of scoliosis? So there's really good data that actually came out of Iowa. Dr. Weinstein, Stu Weinstein out of Iowa, did a 50-year follow-up to track patients and see how they did over time. And it turned out two things mattered. The first thing that mattered is patient's age, age at presentation. And the second thing that mattered is patient's degree of curvature at presentation. So the theme is, if you are skeletally mature, that means you're on the older side, you're not as likely to progress. If you're skeletally immature, that means you're on the younger side. The second aspect of it is if you present with a bigger curvature, then you're much more likely to progress. So in our child's case, she was 13 years old. She had more than a 40 degree curvature. She actually had a 75 degree curvature, which is quite a bit. So based on this study, she would have a 90% risk of progression. Now that's, that's quite a bit. In general, these curves tend to progress about one degree per year. And as you can imagine, that can be quite a lot as a child continues to grow and turns into an adult where the progression continues. What about the long-term implications of that? So let's say we let the curves progress, so what? Well, it has implications as, well, as far as when the child grows up and becomes an adult. So it turns out, based on this long-term study, 13% of patients actually underwent surgery as adults. So that's, a, that's not an insignificant number. And 19% actually had daily severe back pain. And about 22% of the patients had difficulty with breathing, dyspnea, or some kind of shortness of breath. So certainly scoliosis has implications long-term, both in terms of back pain, as well as in terms of your lung development. So those things are certainly important to think about as well. So how do we treat scoliosis? Well, it really depends on curve magnitude and patient's age. And both of these are very important considerations. So for the skeletally immature patient, that means patient who has growth remaining, the magnitude of the curve really is very important to take into consideration. So if the curve is small, so if it's less than 25 degrees, you observe. And then 
you have the patient come back in clinic and see how they do. We get another radiograph and see if the curve has progressed or it's about the same. If the curve is somewhere in the middle range, the 25 to 45 degree range, then bracing is the treatment of choice. And braces can be extremely effective, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. If the curve is above 50 degrees, surgery can be an option. It's not mandatory, but it's an option because surgery can help halt curve progression. For the skeletally mature patient, you can observe, unless the curve is really big, so the curve is above 50 degrees, surgery can be an option. But for smaller curves, the risk of progression is not very high. So as a result, observation is certainly a reasonable option. But some patients are dissatisfied with their curve or the curve is leading to pain despite of them being skeletally mature. And as a result, surgery can be an option for curves that are 40, 40 to 50 degree range. So what about our patient? Well, our patient was 13 years old. She was one year post menarche, no back pain, and she had a 75 degree major curve. So that's a pretty, pretty significant amount of curvature. So based on the data we saw, she is at, like, uh, she's at high likelihood of progression. So uh, what do we recommend? Do we recommend no interventions or follow-up? We recommend follow-up in one year, recommend bracing, or recommend surgery? Well, based on the data we saw, you know, option one and two are not really reasonable options. And option three, bracing, is really most effective for 25 to 45 degree range. So it's not really a great option. So surgery is certainly an option, and that's the discussion we had with the family. So the question becomes, how do braces work? Well, braces are basically stiff plastic jackets that provide a constant force. And the goal of that is to hold curve progression. So they don't necessarily improve the curvature, but they can certainly prevent it from getting worse. They work best when they're worn all the time. And this is a really important point. So you really have to encourage the child to wear it 16 to 23 hours a day. Because the more amount of time the force is there, the more likely it's going to help prevent curve progression. Now, there are many different kinds of braces. And bracing can be stopped when the child stops growing. So it's not a permanent thing. It's only during the skeletally immature phase till the child is done growing, and then you transition them out of the brace. What about scoliosis surgery? So what's scoliosis surgery? Well, scoliosis surgery is something that has changed quite a bit over the years. Historically, it used to be a combination of different types of bone grafts, different types of hooks, and other devices. Now it most commonly consists of posterior spinal fusion. So what that means is that anchors, which are screws, are placed in the spine and held together with rods. The vertebral bodies are fused together, so they heal into a solid brick of bone. And the main goal is to halt curve progression. And most of the time, because these screws are so powerful, you can actually have a good control of the spine. And if possible, you can actually straighten out the curve significantly, as demonstrated here. So that's a pretty, that's a pretty good result of a spinal fusion surgery. Now there are some controversies in the field as far as how much to fuse. What part of the spine do you address with the screws and rods? Or what part of the spine do you leave alone and preserve motion? So there's this concept of selective thoracic fusion and this concept of you know, fuse the whole thing, thoracic plus lumbar fusion. So in our child, as you may recall, she had both a main thoracic curve, a proximal thoracic curve, as well as a lumbar curve. So do you fuse all three? Do you only fuse the thoracic portions, leave the lumbar alone? Well, it de really depends on the curvature and the apical vertebral translation. That means how much is the trunk shifted with respect to the pelvis. In general, my personal philosophy is to spare lumbar motion. And that's something that we do at Hopkins as much as possible. So if we can avoid fusing the lumbar spine, we find that to be very advantageous in terms of preserving the child's mobility, in terms of preserving the child's flexibility, their ability to participate in sports, because your lumbar spine is what gives you most of your motion. The thoracic spine tends to be fairly rigid. So in our, in our child, on the Bender films, you can see that the lumbar curve actually straightens out. And then in this case, uh, when bending to the other side, it's accentuated. But the fact that it straightens out when bending to the left is very encouraging. That tells me that over time, if we do a selective thoracic fusion, she'll not necessarily need additional surgery for the lumbar spine. So back to our case, that's what we did. We decided to do a selective thoracic fusion with the idea that the lumbar curve would normalize over time without having to limit the child's flexibility. And as you can see, the proximal thoracic and the main thoracic curves were fused and essentially is fairly straight. The lumbar curvature we left alone 
to allow the child's motion and ability to participate in sports and ability to be active. And this was uh, the goals of the surgery. So with surgery, we were able to halt curve progression, which is the primary goal of surgery. In addition to that, we were actually not only halt curve progression, but we were actually able to improve the deformity quite a bit, even though that's not the primary goal of surgery. So she went down from about 75 degrees to about 15 degrees. So that's a tremendous amount of improvement. And the way we can do that is because of all the modern instrumentation that's available to us. As you can see, preoperatively, her right shoulder was slightly higher, and now her shoulders are even. So that's a pretty significant win. You were able to achieve harmonious spinal alignment and preserve the lumbar motion, which in my mind is one of the most rewarding aspects of doing selective thoracic fusion. So Dr. Sponseller and I are the two adolescent spine surgeons who take care of scoliosis at Hopkins. If any questions, you can email me at amitjain at jhmi.edu. Thank you very much.